So you're you're in LA, you're in Hollywood. Right. And you're starting to get some, some work. Well my path was get a job, don't work for a year. Get a job, don't work for a year. That's what the way it started for me. Tell me about your impression of how you were perceived. How, I, I don't think I've, I've known you for years and I've never asked you this question. Uh, I want to put it properly, but what types of roles were available to audition for you? Well, I knew there was always going to be some activity like uh, a few months before Christmas and a few months before uh, St. Patrick's Day. There's always activity at that time. And I started to think, you know, that's, I don't necessarily want to do just that all the time, and I don't want to be a psych gag, and a lot of that kind of stuff came up, and every now and then if I was had a, like a good meaty role, I'd be on the set and the director might say, you know, could you, when you run up at this moment, can you just bite him on the ass? And I would be like, what, why? Would you <laughs> what? do that? No, yeah. <laughs> absolutely not. So, you know, there was a lot of times where I said, you know, that's not something I'm going to do. Um, and there were times that I said that before getting the job, too. And there were several auditions that I, you know, would talk to the casting directors and go, you know, this is really degrading. I, I can't see why you would ever want to. And the next, thank you, goodbye, you know. Yeah, yeah. But as I started to get more roles, um, people started to, to listen to what I had to say. And notice that you were a person, notice that you could actually exactly. act. And, if, right. and that if I was going to put on this suit, you know, and play a character, that it had to be a character. It had to be uh, something with the humanness, human qualities, not just play the psych gag, not just play this, you know, being uh, to be objectified in this moment. And, um, you know, there were several people, like I can think of uh, Pam Reed, um, she had a show uh, called Home Court, yeah. and I was playing a father who was trying to impress his son and put himself in the St. Patrick's Day parade, and his son was ashamed of him. So there's a role there where I'm in the leprechaun outfit, but there's some meat to that, and there's something substantial there, and they kept going for this, because it was a sitcom, they kept also going for this sort of derogatory stuff that I didn't appreciate, but in talking to Pam Reed about it, you know, she was totally on the same page with me, and, you know, we would literally sit and rewrite scenes before we shot them on the shoot night, you know. So there's experiences like that that I'm truly grateful for, that I had an opportunity to be a voice. In our business, they talk about odd things as the gag, you know, like, you, as an actor, you don't want to be the gag necessarily. And I, I can relate to what you're saying because the beginning of my career, the first 10 years, amongst our own group, we call them bitter cripple roles, but I played the angry veteran, the angry disabled activist, and finally I got older and somebody said, well, he could be a judge, I suppose, or <laughs> he could be a professor. Or ultimately, thank God, he could be a coroner, but it's... It's really strange. We'll let them touch dead people. Yeah, we'll yeah. let them. That's, right. that's <laughs> weird. We can do that. But no, I'm, I'm so grateful for the opportunities I've had. But I can relate real strongly to what you're saying about uh, having to and daring, really, to explain to somebody, I'm a human being. Yeah, I'm a little person. Yeah, I'm a amputee. You're whatever. a little person, too? I am. As you're well. really messed up, Dave. Well, I, <laughs> when I take my prosthetics off, I'm shorter oh, than you. No. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Right. We'll have to, you know, behind closed doors to <laughs> yes, try this out. <laughs> double bolted too, I think. Uh. <laughs> so, I'm I met you in the '90s, I'm sure. But yeah, tell me about your involvement with the Performers with Disabilities group, the committee. Well, I I I'm, I'm involved. I'm not near as involved on in the way you are, Dave. I mean, you're. I'm trying to sucker you into. Oh, that you're trying part. to. Yeah. I see. <laughs> I see. Take the reins, kind of a thing. Um, you know, it's something I care about. It's something I'm passionate about. Not, it's not just about me. It's never just about me and my group of people. That's right. Because, because I want to feel like I'm part of this whole bigger community of people that Absolutely. are continually overlooked by th this business in a lot of regards. I, th I think some people forget that as performers of disabilities, we're SAG members. And... I care deeply about issues that affect all SAG members as well as issues that affect performers with disabilities, and I know you do too. 
about 20% of the population in America are people with disabilities, and one half of 1% of the words spoken on TV are uttered by you, me, and Marley Matlin. I mean, it's a, it's a very... <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know about, I don't know about that. that. But <laughs> it's, there's a huge gap between our participation in the entertainment business and our representation in the population at large. And I felt some years ago that it was, I've always been looking around for people like you who, who got it, you know, who saw that people with disabilities, people who are different should have a voice in, right. in our popular entertainment, in films and TV and advertising, in radio, in news. And these are, a lot of people will agree with that but it's, it's actually changing the landscape that's proving to be different. And I think, well, well I, what are your ideas on my, Well, my, my, one of my feelings is that, that, that the package is not the character, that the character comes with the package. Like your disability, you know, prior to your role on CSI, your disability a lot of times, as you said, was seen as the character. Right. The character is the disability, not the character has some different ability about them, some different aspect about them that doesn't become paramount to who you are. I really resonated with what you said a minute ago. For I, I've been in four different shows entitled The Squeaky Wheel about an angry guy in a wheelchair. Four different shows independent of each other. <laughs> this is back in the 80s. <laughs> and so I, I really fought hard to try to find the human core of the character and to get that across. Sometimes people just wanted the, you know, the easy joke. Right. But it, it's... Well, on my episode of CSI, it, on your show, was called A Little Murder. That's right. <laughs> well, I, I fortunately am not the producers of the writers, but <laughs> I, you know, I'm more concerned at this point of my career with employment, you know, and I think... Absolutely. I think that we all are. It's, it, so, it, sometimes it, people think we don't have senses of humor. But. Sure, but it's how do we make that, how do we make it work? How do we make it work in a way that, that you and I would both see as believable and not the stereotypical notion of what, say, a writer sees or a producer sees. I mean, right. I've been on sets where I've heard producers go, can't we do something with them? Can't we play with them somehow? And I'm like, what the hell does that even mean? You know, just let me do my thing. Do they, what do you? Uh, you have a cigar yeah, exactly. Can't, you know, I'll I'll do the cigar. I'll do the gimmicky stuff. But you know, I don't know what that. I mean, do you want to pick me up and move me to another part of the room? You know, I don't know what what the yeah, goal is. Show there business with that. is everything from extremely silly to extremely profound, and usually somewhere in the middle. But yeah, the the idea of uh, not being stereotyped is a it's a pretty important concept, and it seems like it's an ongoing thing. You know that. It never goes away. We, you, you know, like on March 3rd of 2015, everybody will understand. It doesn't work that way. So right. what, do you have any thoughts on what needs to happen vis-a-vis -vis performers with disabilities and the business? I think, I think what needs to happen is what is happening. If there's a continual dialogue, and if at times it seems one-sided, I know it's not. Because I know when I get in the room and I get an opportunity to talk about something that I feel needs a change or something that I feel needs to be addressed in terms of its reality uh, and that, that I feel would strengthen my character, I feel that's a step in the right direction. I feel that when we are active in the, on the committee and we get a chance to say to the powers that be, the producers, the executives, look, you need to give us more opportunity to be seen. And, and they receive that in a positive way, then I think we're, we're on the right path. But even in my career, I've always seen everything as a lot of times it's baby steps and it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be leaps and bounds. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna be able to throw off the elf suit, throw off the leprechaun suit or whatever that is that I might be putting on to play a role to all of a sudden be this other guy who's just seen as this other guy. What's Although your, I get all those, I get all those roles too. Right. But what is, what's the favorite role thus far that you've had? I had a great role on um, Bones that I really liked a lot. And uh, I played um, 
one of the heads of the State Department. And I had a great animosity between uh, David Boreanaz's character. We had sort of a, a, a camaraderie, but also a head-to-head -head kind of battle, because right. we were coming at politics from two different sides of the street. And I felt that that was, I had a chance to shine. I felt that I had a chance to be human. And when they made the, the little quips, I didn't play along with the joke. I was like, don't mess with me, you know, because I can make your life hell kind of a thing. Isn't it great so, to have a little power yeah, in yeah. your character? So given that, given that power, um, and that's what a lot of this is for me, is when I'm seen as a human being, that's when I feel most empowered. Well, I'm, if, if I may, I'm, I'm proud of you, not because you're a, a little person, but because you're a good actor, a really fine actor. And Thank you. You're, you're Thank you. Can you read that from no, there? A really fine act. No. <laughs> exceptional. You Shut missed up. exceptional. Don't, stop deflecting <laughs> praise here. You, yes, mother. You're, what you're doing is affecting things down, down the line, which is humbly what I'd, I'd like to do too. That it's, it's not enough to be an African American or an Asian man or a Filipino woman or a a little person or an amputee or what have, whatever, we're in a business that's really competitive and it demands excellence and creativity and we have all of that and we have uh, a much larger percentage of those kind of people. You know, it's, I, I never want anything given to me and I, and I, I know that in, in you as well. It's so important uh, to come to the set with your lines learned and ready, ready to play. And well, I, I think ready. it's even more important for you and I to show up like that because we don't want to feel like we were given a charity or given a favor in any way. So we, I feel like we have to be even doubly prepared and twice as good. I want to see more and more people with disabilities qualified uh, get the chance to audition. Then, as far as I'm concerned... Well, you and I both know there's plenty of unqualified people out there that yeah, are auditioning people. for things. That's right, exactly. So, <laughs> you know, so... You know, it's, I, I've often said that it's about having the right to succeed and to fail, because it's a... You know, if they call 100 people in for a role, one's going to get it. And right. it's great when it's you, and it hurts when it's not, and that will never change. Right. Well, and you and I, I think, have always seen it as, well, I have anyway, as a double-edged sword where your accomplishments maybe are seen as greater, um, but at the same time, people can say that you aren't as good, but you were the best in the room. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it, it, there, there's this, this notion that, well, you know, he's the best that we could get, you know? So... Uh, that's never I, been my I, I agree with talking? you in the sense that, you know, it's, it is about who are the more accomplished performers in, in the PWD community that hopefully can get the opportunities. I know, you and I both know several fine actors and actresses that, that don't get the kind of opportunities they should be getting. I mean, the consideration, um, just going to an audition sometimes, the last, one of the last auditions I was at was up an enormous flight of stairs. And I thought right away, there's a whole group of people that's eliminated. It was enough for me to get up there, but there's a whole group of people that aren't even going to get an opportunity to read for this just because of the stairs. And right. it doesn't necessarily mean that they shouldn't have the opportunity, but they're just not going to get the opportunity. So because it's not a consideration, it's not, it's not an internal consideration on the producer's end to go, you know, this needs to be accessible so that we can call anybody in, Right. you know?